Imagine having a dream to become a world-class innovator. You envision yourself using complex math formulas and physics to engineer a device that changes the course of history. But on your first day of astrophysics class, you realize that this is really tough. So you decide to let go of that dream and think, maybe I'll try something else. Maybe I'll become a doctor instead. So you switch to studying medicine, hoping it'll be easier. But to your surprise, it's still super difficult. The truth is, regardless of what our academic goals are, the road ahead is full of challenging classes. Our journey in medicine took over 10 years and came with plenty of learning struggles in complex topics. We've made a lot of mistakes, but learned a lot about learning in the process. So we wanna share three ideas that made learning difficult subjects not only effortless, but also enjoyable. It sounds crazy, right? Imagine actually enjoying the class that's completely kicking your ass right now. This first idea is something I call learn like a painter. Think about how a paintbrush works. Each stroke of the brush is incomplete. There are splotches and gaps all along the stroke, but we don't paint trying to fill in every last gap as we go, rather we go in layers. To relate this to studying, it's okay to skip some information on our first pass of the material. In fact, I find it smarter to keep moving the paintbrush forward. Learning difficult concepts are only difficult because we have no prior knowledge, no context to understand them. So learning like a painter works for several reasons. We're gathering a broader perspective of the topic and acquiring the needed knowledge to understand the difficult concepts better. Imagine if Bob Ross painted a masterpiece top to bottom filling in every single detail along the way. We would have no idea what he was trying to draw until the very end, but instead he paints in layers. He builds the groundwork, the background, then outlines the shapes and structures so that it's easier to actually grasp the details and the difficult parts of the painting. So when learning brand new content, we have no idea what the painting is supposed to look like. That's why it's so difficult. We can only think about it based on the little context that we have. And this leads us into a trap of something called the anchoring effect, where we have a tendency to latch on to the first piece of information that we learn about something, even if there's new evidence that it might be incorrect. Without prior knowledge, our brain literally doesn't know what it doesn't know. In medical school, I had a really difficult time learning obstetrics because unlike something like neurology or cardiology that are somewhat covered in the classes leading up to med school, I had zero prior knowledge about obstetrics. Plus, I'm a dude, so I never had to look it up before. And I remember having a really, really hard time understanding the nuances between primary amenorrhea or secondary or primary or secondary hypogonadism. You know, I'd learn about one thing and then I'd latch onto that idea. And then I'd try to fit that mold of how I understood it to another definition and nothing made sense to me. But then I started to learn like a painter. Instead of going in the order of my textbooks or my lectures, I started to learn in broad strokes by seeing more patients and doing randomized practice problems with explanations. Learning about the treatment or method of diagnosis made it more clear to me why something was a risk factor or why the pathology was the way it was. Things began to click because I started to learn in layers. Understanding the easier concepts first then served as that prior knowledge that was needed for me to understand the more difficult concepts. So this meant that it was incredibly inefficient for me to spend too much time learning a new challenging concept. That's the mistake I used to make all the time. I'd get super frustrated spending hours and hours trying to figure something out. Instead, it's better to skip the harder concepts and collect more knowledge from concepts that are easier to understand. Just move the paintbrush forward because it's very likely that the easier concepts to understand will then become that prior knowledge I needed to understand the stuff that I skipped. So if it takes me more than a few minutes to wrap my head around, I just skip it move on and gather more information. And that doesn't mean only from the textbook. We can gather information from anywhere. If it's a medical disease, see how that disease presents visually or socially or compares to other diseases. Bring it into context because learning the easier things will then make the harder things click. So this rule works excellent for kitsunes as they prefer to frequently skip around and learn multiple topics at once. They also tend to be more creative, hence the painter idea. The next idea is to learn like a hunter. 
Adopt the mindset of a master predator. The thrill of the hunt gives purpose to the game. The most skilled hunters are fascinated by their prey and are curious about what makes them tick. They know where they hang out, what they eat, when they sleep, and they try to stay 10 steps ahead of them at all times. So to relate this to studying, we need to become fascinated with what we're learning about. Genuine interest for a topic makes us naturally curious and hungry to learn more about it. Of course, the next obvious question becomes, how do I become curious about what I'm learning? Like, what if it's not interesting? Complex topics are difficult enough, but they become even more painful painful when we're apathetic towards them. And these are very common concerns. I felt this way about a lot of my classes. Our brains aren't wired to find everything fascinating, and there's a reason for that. Because our brain gathers so much information every day, it has to be selective about what it remembers. When we learn something that our brain does not perceive as relevant or useful, we're gonna forget it. But if we create curiosity by relating it to something we do find interesting, then our brains will retain the information much better. So a hunter might find learning about physics boring, but what if they relate it to their love of the hunt and think, wait, maybe I can reverse engineer a trap using this equation to corner my prey. For me personally, I find mathematics quite challenging and boring. So one of my favorite scenes in Spider-Man was when Peter Parker actually used math to win in a 1v1 against Doctor Strange. He used math to beat magic. Suddenly math becomes more interesting. It's using an inquiry-based approach to learning. We're looking for patterns between abstract topics. We're looking for answers to our questions. This is why we love analogies so much. So some of the best questions to ask include, how does this idea relate to something I already know? How could I use this idea somewhere else? what happens to this idea under a different set of conditions. This is not to say that there were times in the past where I literally could not relate some concepts to prior knowledge, but that doesn't mean I still couldn't learn like a hunter. At the very least, we can still try to have some fun hunting for the answers themselves. Like treat the hunt for the answers like a game. Maybe you can do it with a study buddy to see who can get more answers faster and use that as a motivation to learn. Learning like a hunter speaks to those in Torah club, like me. Torahs are goal-oriented and often competitive, so naturally something like a game or a hunt would appeal to this brain type the most. And the final idea is to learn like an athlete. There are days they love the sport and there are days they absolutely hate it. But what separates top athletes from the rest of the pack is their ability to show up consistently regardless of how they feel. They also understand the importance of self-reflection to identify areas for improvement. To relate this to studying, in order to learn the difficult subjects, we need to cultivate a habit for discipline and self-reflection that's completely detached from the way that we feel. For a long time, I tried to rely purely on a motivational spark to get by, but waiting for inspiration to spark is frankly unreliable. More often than not, I'd feel defeated and frustrated by difficult topics, and this would set a negative precedent for the entire day. So that's a very counterproductive way to think about motivation, if we're waiting for the way that our emotions make us feel. Jeff Hayden talks about this paradox in his book, The Motivation Myth. Most people believe that motivation is required to take action, but what he observed is that it's actually taking action that creates and reinforces motivation. If we persevere, we begin to make progress, and that progress is what actually builds builds our motivation for learning difficult things. So instead, we need to be vigilant and show up even when we don't want to, to make it a non-negotiable. And seeing consistent progress will become the motivation we need to keep getting started. But simply creating a habit of discipline doesn't lead to improvement. Athletes can create all the motivation in the world, but if they don't analyze their weaknesses, then they'll lose the same matches over and over again. They also need to implement a self-reflection practice. My favorite question in starting self-reflection is to ask, what is the reality of the situation? It's a question that asks for objective, factual data, not data based on the way that we think or the way that we feel. Because we can ignore reality all we want, but we can't ignore the consequences of ignoring reality. I used to blast through as many practice tests and problem sets as I could. I get fired up with motivation, doing like 300 practice questions a day. But then I realized I wasn't improving at all, and I kept getting the same questions wrong. Had I taken the time to analyze these questions and figure out why my thought process was incorrect or what I wasn't understanding, I would have improved much faster. Another example was how I would always underestimate how long it took me to learn something difficult. 
Well, actually, people in general do. It's called the planning fallacy. I would give myself two or three days to learn something really difficult, where in reality, it actually took me a lot longer. Without a self-reflection practice, I never would have recognized that. So as a general principle, I tend to give myself more time than I need to learn the difficult things. This rule really speaks to those in Kuma Club. Kumas tend to be more methodical and like consistency, so developing habits and routines will make the learning process much more enjoyable for them. Regardless of what difficult subjects or skills we need to learn, these are the three rules that have guided us the most. It really goes to show that we have a lot to learn from those who have taken the time to master very difficult skills. The next reasonable step in the process for learning difficult things would be to learn how to beat procrastination. And we've also explored that topic very deeply, and you can check it out right here.